Dear brothers and sisters, I'm deeply uh, moved by the opportunity and privilege of being with you this evening, and all the more so because of the honoring that we are giving this evening to uh, our dear friend and brother in Christ, Dallard Willard. What greater privilege could I have than to uh, speak, uh, as it were, with the continuation of his voice? When we think of the context of Dallas, I can't help but think of the events of the early summer of May 1962. It was the Cuban Missile Crisis that brought us to the brink of nuclear uh, apocalypticism. We were terrified. And what followed the shaking of the foundations of the Western world because of that was then, of course, the student revolts, the hippie movement, um, the sexual revolution, the uh, feminist revolt. All those issues that we now think of as postmodern were shaking the foundations of our society during the 70s into the 80s. And Dallas was the prophet for that period. Because in the anarchy, the moral anarchy that we were going through, this voice of the need for the spiritual disciplines was exactly the prophetic voice of its times. And so very often, as it is certainly I think of Dallas, that it's great times that create great prophets. And uh, it's in that context that I certainly give my tribute to Dallas tonight. We first met each other at a conference in Peter Maritzburg in the late 1980s, I think it was 1988, uh, convened by Africa Enterprise, then engaged in challenging the growing crisis of apartheid. He was addressing his favorite theme of the spiritual disciplines while I was with him on a complementary theme of the spiritual classics. And we certainly embraced each other straight away. During that leisurely week of initial friendship, it led later to numerous strangers constantly saying to me, oh, you must know Dallas Willard. You speak like him on the same themes. <laughs> and that was indeed more than a compliment, for it gave me reassurance that we were certainly speaking on the same wavelength in a countercultural kind of way. And so, as a, a Christian philosopher, dear Dallas has been such a bright beacon, as we've heard tonight, for the pursuit of con uh, godliness. And we certainly will continue to sorely miss his presence. When John Cole first brought this issue of his foundation as an institute of spiritual formation at Biola, I urged him to integrate it as far as possible with the Talbot School of Theology. And so I'm privileged to be invited to continue the dialogue in this address. For there was a time when I was on the board of Fuller Seminary when it was seriously questioned whether Fuller should remain a seminary or become a university with three divergent schools going in three different directions. And I'm also delighted that Dr. Stephen Evans is with us at this conference, for I think it was he who first raised the question in 1989 in his book, Wisdom and Humanness and Psychology, Can Psychology Be Christian? Certainly Dallas echoed the same question which now lies behind my address tonight. Can psychology be Christian? For some university experiences as an academic advisor, I have seen the incremental crisis of Christian orthodoxy facing our Christian colleges and universities in America. And this I believe to be consequent upon the unexamined marriage of Niburian Christianity and culture with scholarship in the humanities within our Christian colleges. It's an unholy alliance. 
It is the uncritical embrace of deistic premises for the creation of human sciences in the 19th century. If deism is not expressive of the living God, how then can enlightenment human sciences ever be human enough? Is this not the basic cause for the disenchantment of what Charles Taylor calls the malaise of modernity? <clears throat> and so my uh, address tonight will focus on three issues. Christian blindness in having um, a professional identity that is not primarily to use Pauline language in Christ. Cultural blindness in a shallow understanding of human depravity on what has been throughout this century, this last century, a secure continent. And thirdly, the postmodern shift from social ethics, denominations and ideologies towards the personal, the converted and the committed as a reshaping of Christian identity for each Christian. Because we're here then to focus upon psychology, we will start by looking at what is the Christian blindness in having a professional identity. In focusing, of course, on this one profession, we could say that the same critiques could be applied to many more of our disciplines. As it is, you may be judging me already as being very presumptuous. After all, I'm not at all trained as a psychologist, so I'm speaking from the outside. But let me share with you what are some of the hidden assumptions in psychological professionalism. For when we examine the interface between Christian soul care and formation and the disciplines of psychology, we face profound inconsistencies. Weber, in seeking a place for religion, spoke of the iron cage of rationalism. But I believe that we are in a subtle trap in extending ourselves to embrace the iron cage of professionalism. Perhaps we're like the proverbial blind man describing the elephant. Each psychological discipline, whether it be clinical or social, experimental, cognitive or developmental psychology is biased towards a particular professional viewpoint. All assume we know what it means to be human. If then one's personal identity is so restrained, all one's perspectives of the human spirit become distorted and even blinded. But to engage in critical thinking about the hidden assumptions of each of these disciplines is to make one's own professional identity too vulnerable for sustained exposure. An example of this is the irony that lies behind the history of Eric Erickson's redirection from being a psychoanalyst to being a specialist in identity studies, which marked his new approach when he started researching on the young man Luther in 1956. For in midlife crisis, Erickson was discovering that his professional identity was coming under discredit. It wasn't Luther's, it was probably his that he was more motivated about. Because psychoanalysis was beginning to be condemned under scientific scrutiny. Ever since then, the fascination with identity studies reflects, among other things, the precariousness of having only a professional identity. In a very different book that I've written recently with a psychiatrist on the challenge of aging to the church, we're overpopulated with seniors who've lost their identity. It's a new subtle form of apartheid for people who have no identity other than, you know, the, the pursuit of stirring out their lives with coffee spoons at Starbucks in the morning and their only monument lost golf balls in the afternoon. That's a senior. And we're getting overpopulated with seniors. But more serious is the professional blindness already alluded to. So let me expand. 
In the discipline of psychotherapy, C. Marshall Law observed in 1976 <coughs> that with the crisis of conventional morality, psychotherapists had become the new moral authorities as secular priests. Then a series of writers began to recognize that the profession was accorded primacy within the mythic cult of self-fulfillment and of each individual being seen as the center of his or her own universe. It was what the psychiatrist Philip Cushman called the bounded masterful self. Further reactions have been towards virtue ethics or being value free, but such tend to be moral chatter and vulnerable to cultural change, not grounded in basic human values. Or take the dilemma of social psychology, which assumes the human being is social and yet dealing with individuals, having individual properties. As Paul Ricoeur has observed of sociology, it has no reference to the neighbor as a moral category. For one does not have a neighbor, one makes oneself someone's neighbor. Indeed, the world of the personal is indefinable in sociology. One of the founding fathers of sociology, George Simmel, was largely ignored in his generation because he was trying to give due diligence to individuation in a culture of bias towards sociality, which the more popular fathers of sociology like Comp and Duckman and Weber were all advocating. They were dealing with the rise of the urban industrial expansion of the masses in new systematized forms of knowledge. But in contrast, Simmel's nonconformity was seeking to cultivate morally educated individuals within society. He saw the uniqueness of the human as being far more complex than what social, modern sociologists could compromise with in their notions of atomism, social, and information. The former is the idea that society is composed of self-contained units called individuals each seeking their own purposes, while the latter is tied up with a general liberalist, uh, liberationist, individualist society that is now so prevalent. Both types of agent fit well into the Cartesian hypercognitive and instrumental self of both our modern and postmodern cultures. Again, in cognitive, uh, psychology, the penchant for the scientific um, study of the human is as strong as in any other branch of psychology. Have we got, uh, uh, sorry, have I got the next one? Its focus is upon memory, perception, attention, learning, and their disorders but its reliance on efficient causation and mechanism, enhanced greatly by the artificial intelligence gained in computer science, and now also by neuroscience, all exaggerate individualism. It presupposes what Charles Taylor has called the punctured self, a self viewed as free and rational to the extent it can fully distinguish itself from the natural and social worlds and be able to treat these worlds instrumentally. Or finally, upon the hidden assumptions of developmental, uh, I don't, yeah, here we are. Uh, should have passed these on. I'm sorry, I'm not used to uh, uh, this high tech stuff. Uh, just, uh, I don't belong quite to that generation. <laughs> or finally, uh, we have um, uh, developmental psychology what originally uh, Piaget calls genetic epistemology. Trained as a biologist, Piaget argues that assimilation and adaptation are essential biological functions which are applicable to the development of human intelligence. Unflexible and, unst and instable, unstable and inflexible in the child, they become stabilized with adult development through the four stages of childhood that he maps out. As a liberal Protestant, he desired a reconciliation of religion with science 
arguing God to be imminent, not transcendent. So that questions about God should not be sought biblically, but simply empirically. Corresponding to August Comte's three stages of man as the theological, the metaphysical, and the scientific or positivistic, Piaget posited three moral stages of the animistic or magical, the religious morality, and the morality of social reciprocity. It was when Nietzsche announced God is dead in 1882 that the theories of these psychologists were then coming to life. Today, however, there's growing reaction to these narrow views of personal reality from many different distinct perspectives, such are Heidegger's participatory philosophy of complex engagement with the world, or Clifford Geertz's stratigraphic cultural models of the self, or the moral space of Taylor, or the self as the other in the thinking of Levinas and Paul Ricoeur. Gaining more clarity about ourself tends then to leave developmental psychology fragmented and inchoate, as expressive of a lack of, co of moral cohesion. Further blindness is, of course, the result of scientism uh, being so significant in the rise of psychology. And this occurs in being ahistorical about one's own discipline. For doing one's profession is not the same thing as critiquing the history of each profession. That is, as seeing its own subculture arising from within a specific temporal context. This is more than simply knowing that Wundt created the first laboratory in 1879 in Leipzig for experimental psychology or that Freud first developed interest in the interpretation of dreams at the end of the 19th century for his further elaboration of psychoanalysis, or that William James first began to explore varieties of human consciousness about the same time. What we have to recognize is that each has a historical contextual development that we're creating new subcultures, each having their own social concerns as ideas who time, whose time had come to be explored. Something new had appeared, which challenged exploration of a new territory in need of being known in the ongoing history of ideas. Historically, psychology is as old as philosophy, both arising from the Western classical tradition. But the new prominence given to psychology as a science as an independent series of disciplines in the latter 19th century gave psychology the opportunity to seek a similar emancipation from philosophy. Now the mirage appeared that in being ahistorical, psychology could become also a new series of sciences. The assumption was then added that method uncovers truth which then deepened the pursuit of empirical knowledge as the scientific method to follow. Yet even in science, verification is less capable of application, the more complex the system becomes. So now many scholars within psychology readily grant that human beings are less subject to falsification, a corollary of verification than simpler physical systems. Mathematical models also can only go so far in interpreting human behavior. <clears throat> if you've ever visited Eugene Peterson at his Montana farm, there's a bus in the morning and uh, Eugene is landed with his visitor for the rest of the day. There's only one bus out at night. <laughs> so he starts with a basic question. And so Eugene said to this young innocent sociologist from Alberta, Oh, you've come to see me. What's your specialty? Statistics. Oh, well then I reckon your profession resembles pornography, twice over. <laughs> For you promise intimacy, but you don't deliver. <laughs> <laughs> Without critical appreciation then of cultural history, 
one remains blinded by one's own specialization, especially when it concerns the deep mysteries of being human. Again, without psychology being a moral science, it tends to see only the canons of normativity, not of good and evil. In general, the whole profession of psychology then is deeply embedded in the mores of individualism and therefore cannot be a critical voice against our contemporary culture. Thirdly, there's the blindness of hubris. This is to say, taking one's assumptions for granted and never seeking plausible alternatives because of the desire to quickly succeed in a narrow field. Like the pursuit of success itself, it entails a restrictive quest which generates its own seeds of failure by being too narrowly and often too hastily focused. Recent scientific studies have demonstrated that articles in Nature or other specialized journals are now reporting more frequent claims than in the past. So that the number of discoveries that are then found to be false have intensified because of impatient self-ambitions to acclaim fame. Such self-deception prevails in desiring new discoveries to be expressive of one's own cleverness rather than often the generosity of teamwork. It becomes a form of professional narcissism. In a powerful chapter, Self-Deception and the Structure of the Social Sciences, Robert Trivers explores how self-deception is so ingrained in our human condition that the greater the social context of a discipline, especially in the sphere of the human, the greater will be biases due to self-deception and the greater the retardation of the field compared with less social disciplines. Actually, many of the contemporary forms of psychology are expressive, as we've seen, of 19th century theories whose problems and methods are now questionable. And so this is well surveyed by Daniel Robinson in his book, An Intellectual History of Psychology. The whole phenomenon of a claim that psychology is a science is a 19th century idea which cuts it off from the longevity of psychology as we've seen as the twin discipline with philosophy that is traceable back to the classical world. For the two great axial dimensions of human mental intelligence and emotional consciousness are such that philosophy and psychology should never be separated. Likewise, to link psychology morally with Judaism and Christianity is a much more fruitful dialogue which would prevent such folly as to eliminate the category of the soul from the history of humanity. Likewise, if secular psychologists assume human consciousness can only be understood as a-religious, then they're also assuming such human studies are also a-historical. Some schools of philosophy have tried such imperialism, notably logical positivism, as I was struggling with when I was in my early days at Oxford with Lewis. But uh, as Lewis so loudly proclaims against it, they failed as being too reductionistic of the human condition, which must always include the ethical as well. So hidden assumptions tend to be most hid from reductionistic thinkers. As Brent uh, Slyf and his colleagues uh, in their book, Critical Thinking About Psychology, um, has spoken um, of the hidden assumptions and the plausible alternatives, uh, we need to realize that uh, we're taught to be critical, but are we taught to be critical of our own profession? And so covering six major psychological sub-disciplines, the authors of this book, Critical Thinking About Psychology, uh, explore what are the assumptions that are peculiar to each field that are, of course, uh, distortions of reality. 
And so in his book, The Folly of Fools, The Logic of Deceit and Self-Deception in Human Life that I've already referred to, Robert Trivers has a section on the psychology of self-deception as a form of psychic immunology that we all inherit in our own social behavior. For the hallmark of self-deception is the denial of self-deception. And so Trivers explores the possibility that neurophysiology may open up that the human brain itself is self-deceiving in its distinct functions between the right and the left hemispheres. Certainly Freud was himself self-deceived in claiming psychoanalysis to have the status of a science. And religiosity too, of course, can be hugely self-deceptive. But the vigorous denials of secularism and materialism are also profoundly self-deceptive. Indeed, whatever quest for self-possessiveness is exercised in egotism, ambitious power and hubris will all contain their own seeds of deception. It's the deepening of humility, the deepening of self-consciousness, the sharing with good friends, the meditative life in reverence that will all help us to be less vulnerable to the self-deceptive traits of our fallen nature. So we come now to our second major uh, topic, and that is cultural blindness in shallow understanding of human depravity. And what I've recently been exploring is the contrast between the whole environmental culture of North America and uh, the uh, contrast that we find in Western Europe. You see, these uh, theories of uh, Thomas Hobbes or indeed of uh, John Locke or Jean-Jacques Rousseau or all the others that followed uh, through the 19th century were doing this as a kind of laboratory of individualism in North America, which was an empty continent. There was no conflict with the natives in terms of ideology. There was in terms of their uh, uh, disappearance and violence. But uh, think of the fact that Individualism has been unchallenged in North American culture from day one. And think of the contrast in Western Europe where the social hierarchies, even though there was the rise and fall of monarchy and the rise of republicanism and uh, various other forces, but nevertheless, there were always social constraints on the abstract theorizing about the philosophy of the self. And so what also we should bear in mind is that uh, two world wars have destroyed Western culture in a way in which the North American culture was never attacked in the same way. You've had huge issues over the Civil War and you've also still inherited all the result of the culture of slavery, which is still embedded in North American culture. But uh, the significance that I find in Europe is that the destruction of the Enlightenment Prussian culture after the First World War led to a radical rethinking of life in, a, in Europe. And so a variety of thinkers after First World War, notably Jewish and German thinkers, in societies like the Patmos Club that was set up in 1918, tried to reimagine eschatologically like John of Patmos, what a new German society could become. It was a radical view of the reconstruction of German society. Its members were as diverse as Karl Barth, Martin Buber, George Simmel, Max Schäschel, uh, Dietrich von uh, rosenstock husey and Dietrich von Hildebrand. Some of their Mentors like Herschel and Max Weber were also sympathetic. And Austrians like the economist Ludwig von Mies 
we're also highlighting the role of the human agent acting not only from necessities, but from ideals. As a consequence, European thinkers in the human sciences were much more influential in conceiving of the human being, much less individualistically, as the agents of social change and moral reconstruction. In America, as we've said, this unchallenged culture of individualism has been incapable of critiquing itself. The more we contrast the continuous uninterrupted individualistic culture then of North American life, the more we realize that uh, the pastoral theology that was developed after the Second World War in America was simply in cahoots. It was in, in line with the whole therapeutic culture of the uh, self-fulfilled individual. And this whole notion of the empty self was itself, of course, an advertising development, a device of turning uh, the enormous industrial productivity of, for war uh, into now plowshares. So you could say the plowshares are now our shopping malls, there are credit cards, there are consuming society that has created this myth of the empty self. And it's in that culture that again we realize that much of our pastoral theology in North America has had a very cozy kind of alliance between uh, Christ and culture. But who is that Christ? Is he a deistic Christ, as the Nebuers were really assuming? Or is he truly the living Christ? But the assumption that our Christian colleges could adopt uh, the human sciences unquestionable as a result of that liaison of Christ and culture is still a legacy with us today. So that's why I ask um, in this whole lecture, and that is, is spiritual formation still somewhat hijacked by the culture that we're in? Now, one of the things that uh, what we see has happened in uh, our spiritual formation is thirdly, that uh, it has been really a device that was adopted by the Association of Theological Schools uh, to really be in tandem with the Vatican II crisis of the recruitment of priests and uh, of the demoralization of the priesthood as a result of child abuse. Um, and the consequence uh, was therefore by the United the American um, uh, Association of Bishops, Catholic Bishops, that we must do something about the reform of priestly formation. So it was priestly formation that gave the cue to the Association of Theological Schools to then have spiritual formation. And so one of the issues which I haven't time to elaborate on in this lecture now is, um, is spiritual formation not something far more profoundly than the whole question of a priestly identity? One of the issues that really is still challenging all the devout, uh, and there's a lot of very pious and very devout literature on priestly formation, but this issue still remains, is that priestly formation essentially a liturgical identity that the priest uniquely is the one who can perform at the mass the uh, the repetition of the incarnate Christ as as, as flesh and uh, blood or is the Catholic uh, identity of priesthood much more a servant leader or a shepherd uh, is it more the pastoral identity that he has and one of the things that's come out from recent surveys, which is very significant, is that those who have a liturgical identity tend to remain longer in the priesthood and to have a more secure identity in their liturg liturgical identity. 
than uh, those who are uh, really more cast into the whole life of their community uh, and all the pressures of the society. And they're the ones that are more likely to give up uh, in disenchantment or in uh, burnout and, and, uh, and sometimes disillusionment. So we're facing today one of the big issues of a pastoral identity is that we have now a new anomalous, uh, anonymous society like AD for Alcoholics Anonymous is for atheist anonymous who have been Christian leaders but who longer have lost their identity as Christians and certainly lost their identity as Christian leaders. We had an article in our local paper just uh, two weeks ago of the pathos of a young man who had been to Bible college and then been to Bible school. And then he taught the Bible in China and was working in the underground church for 20 years. And now he's one of the founders of Atheist Anonymous because he's totally lost his faith. So the precariousness of having a functional identity or professional identity extends to that level in our culture today. Well, I think I'm going to move then on to the last issue. And that is, what then are we prescribing this evening? What I have lived for all my life, certainly since the 1950s, and sacrificed everything for, is not to have a professional identity, but to have an identity as a person in Christ. It's, uh, it's been a, a big struggle, a lot of misunderstanding, because it's so anti-cultural. The question that we all ask each other when we meet a stranger is, what do you do? We have a functional identity. And so the paradigm of moving from the professional to the personal is a huge transition for all of us. It's not easy. And so the kind of thing that has inspired me is to realize that uh, this uh, shift to being a person in Christ was recovered after the Dark Ages, after the debacle of the Shalmung Empire when Christianity in a sense became dead or certainly needing revitalizing that the devotional movements like Bernard of Clairvaux and the Cistercians encouraged a new individuation and a new personal commitment. Bernard refused to be a knight because he was a knight in Christ. He therefore attacked the whole feudal structure of his society and of his own family background to become truly one of the conversi, one of the converted. And I think his conversion was much more than the life of the monastery because he only spent about a third of his time in the monastery. And the rest of the time he was facing the whole European culture as perhaps the most famous spokesman of Christianity in the 12th century, a unique figure indeed. But all of that was because he was standing up to the culture of his times. That movement of individuation that really was part of uh, the change of his period has, of course, is a thing that continues. Because when you're a person in Christ, you're never more yourself than when you are in Christ Jesus. There's no greater richness to having your identity than to be a person in Christ. Now, what does this therefore mean for us as we break down the issues of our time? Well, I think one of the things it does <clears throat> mean is that when we're talking now about conversion, <clears throat> we have to have a far more radical understanding of what conversion is about. 
the Christian, in a sense, is never living but in a process of conversion. He was, or she is, or she will be, but always, past, present, future, the conversion continues, or the transformation continues. And what helps us, I think, to see how radical our conversion is, is that we have, uh, which is an interesting thing that René Girard, when he was asked, how did you become a Christian? As a literary critic, as a cultural anthropologist, René, how did you become a Christian? Well, he said, I became a Christian by reading great literature. He said, it was Aeneas guiding Dante that uh, also was a guide for me. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, it means that Aeneas, in his uh, uh, Virgil in his Aeneas, is critiquing the utter corruption of the Sodom and Gomorrah of first century BC Roman society. And so Dante uses Virgil as his guide to see the utter corruption in the, sixth, in the 15th century of the Flor Florentine society of his day. Mm -hmm. And of course, Proust uses the utter corruption of the Bohemian um, Edwardian life of Paris at the beginning of the 20th century in order to indicate where we flee from the city of destruction. And so, Girard said, it was first of all through great literature. By diagnosing the status quo of the culture that we're in. So that's the first thing. But then, what uh, in his essay, and you might be interested to know that Girard, like uh, Ricoeur, are both people who definitely pinpoint a radical metanoia in their lives. The questioning that I have about Charles uh, Taylor is that he never recites or reflects on any radical conversion that he had. He started as a Marxist Catholic, which is a oxymoron, but he then became left-wing uh, Catholic, and then he became a more orthodox Catholic. But uh, there's a more sunny kind of optimism about the self in, in Charles Taylor that you certainly don't find in Ricoeur, or you certainly don't find in people like Girard. And so in his essay, Conversion in Literature and Christianity, Girard points out that the problem with the Latin word conversio is that it only means turning around in a circle, as one who does with a translation. Whereas truly Christian conversion is linear, open-ended, irreversible, so that the word conversion is really too weak a word. And so what he realizes that we have to do is to perhaps embrace what the Greek church did in the early days of Christianity as a form of penance, to use the word metanoia. Metanoi is a change of mind that involves a radical transformation of the paradigm that one is living in. There's no reverse about it. Every word with ray has got the suggestion of reversal. <laughs> you can recant, you can reform, you can even repent. But when you're under pressure, you can change your mind. But with metanoia, there's no change of mind. There's no change of heart. You're like Bunyan, now have left the city of destruction and you're on a pilgrimage that will never end till you reach the celestial city. And so it's metanoia that produces martyrs who are unafraid of death. It's metanoia that produces great literary classics. That Cervantes is ridiculing the whole feudal system in Don Quixote, as Dante is exploring all the subterranean corruption of uh, high Florentine society in his day, as Dostoevsky did uh, with the Tsar's entourage uh, in Moscow. Or as we said, of Proust, who had this again profound turnaround uh, from where hell was. So today as Christians, we need to show how hellish our culture has become. And we therefore have to realize what dark forces there are. 
Now, as you know, those of you who've read his work, he simply focuses on one of the cardinal's vices, envy. But we need young scholars to explore all the cardinal vices as evil ecosystems that have their sustainability and habitability in total darkness and destruction. So we now today as Christians recognize that what is pivotal to our life is the cross of Christ. It's the death, resurrection of Christ. That which turned fearful and bewildered disciples into men and women that were given a new identity. And no wonder the Apostle Paul more than 200 times is referring to this constant phrase of being in Christ. Now, being in Christ is also the basis for being an individual. I suspect that the word individual is a Christian creation of the early church. And it was used in the primary sense that you are individuated when you accept the equality of all humans, where there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for all are now one in Christ Jesus. To individuate is to liberate with equality, while to personalize is to give moral space to be the self for the other. It is then your mandate, my mandate as Christian educators, to critique our status quo of the human sciences as just not being human enough. And without this, our human future as human persons lies in jeopardy. May I leave with you this last thought that if we have witnessed the death of God with the secularism of the 20th century, we are witnessing the death of humanity in the 21st century. Without God, there is no future for humanity. Thank you very much. <laughs>